Hey, welcome everyone to the movie potluck. Um, so we don't have an intro this week, um, because you know some people have other things to do, so nothing too huge. But we have a massive amount of imagination, and with this particular topic, I'm pretty sure we can all fill in the blanks. In fact, this past week, Pentagon officials held a briefing before Congress where they testified that we do indeed have unidentified flying objects in our skies, and Oddly, not everything was attributed to a weather balloon and gas from Venus. Uh, <laughs> I, whatever those crazy ideas are, uh, they didn't try to attribute them. We actually have unidentified flying objects in our atmosphere. Uh, what does this all mean? Well, your guess is as good as mine, but maybe it sets the groundwork for this week's theme, which is aliens come to Earth. Dun dun. Of all the science fiction movie genres, I think that this is one of my favorites for a couple reasons. First, the movies can get so cheesy. I can mystery science theater them all day long and have so much fun. If you've never seen Transmorphers from 2007, watch it and you'll know exactly what I mean. It's hilarious. Second, there is something so human about realizing that alien movies often include aliens that look so much like us. Bipedal, two eyes, can speak our languages. Generally, they're very home here. Super interesting. Um, we really need to get working on that imagination piece. More seriously, though, aliens are often a metaphor for what we want ourselves to see, what we value, what we find threatening. We often place aliens in the role of being the villains, but sometimes they're the saviors. However, we rarely have a middle ground for them. So our fictional obsession with aliens coming to Earth is slowly changing, though. We have a whole genre of superheroes born in distant places that love, somehow, our planet. Thor, Loki, Thanos, for weird reasons, uh, Superman from DC, we have the Autobots and the Decepticons, we have Venom, we have the Silver Surfer, and without getting too political, it's interesting that aliens from space are often the saviors that we pin all of our hopes for, while real aliens are kind of a dirty word. It's very fascinating to me. Psychologically, we grapple with the truth of alien life, inventing stories of things we cannot fathom being built by humans, like in Alien vs. Predator, in X-Files the movie. We have all of these different ideas about how aliens may have been able to visit us in the past, create these amazing structures, and then just somehow in the 20th and 21st century, we're discovering them. It's very fascinating. Then we have the aliens that come to Earth to conquer us. Uh, M. Night signs. Uh, we have Mars attacks. Cloverfield, which I absolutely hate for so many reasons. Uh, sorry, J.J. Abrams. Uh, Independence Day. Edge of the World. James Gunn Slither. Oh my god, that movie was absolutely both horrific, hilarious, and horrifying. It was just, it was absolutely. It was crazy. The just three really crazy. aces. <laughs> oh my god! I, I, I. We'll get into that, but oh my gosh, that movie really kind of set me off. Uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers is a classic. They Live is another odd alien invasion where the aliens kind of take over our entire infrastructure. Uh, Pacific Rim, big monster fights. Uh, Attack the Block, which I will definitely talk about. Crazy good movie, and of course. Uh, we have the aliens that come as observers, like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, E.T. was here on some kind of foraging mission, Arrival, Men in Black. And we have the completely accidental travelers, like Suicide Squad Starfish. Poor guy, just wanted to get back to the stars. The Thing, Lilo and Stitch, District 9. District 9, we definitely need to talk about really good alien movie. And with all these ideas, I, I think that my favorite movies about aliens are the ones where they explain the world of sadness, sorrow, and justice, and just general human pain by showing us how alien we actually feel from the inside out. K-Pax, K-P-A-X, mm -hmm. Starman, 
and Martian Child are really excellent examples of this kind of genre. So with that little bit of background and some uh, I don't know, interesting ideas, hopefully, to start our conversations, I'm going to introduce my panel. I am going to introduce Tori first. Tori, how are you today? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here. I love awesome. aliens. Aliens are like my favorite thing. So uh, the, I think this is going to be a really good conversation, actually. Yeah. And <laughs> Betty, Betty, are you here? Did we lose you or are you here? I am here. How's it going? All right. Uh, I am super good. How are you feeling about our topic tonight? Um, good. But I can't <laughs> say I um, know too many aliens come to Earth movies. Uh, are you a big science fiction fan, Betty? I guess that depends. Because okay. I really like time travel and ghosts and things like that. Okay. Well, we'll 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 try to break down what makes a good alien movie uh, and see if we can add a little bit of clarity to some different types. Um, I'm going to start this whole conversation out by asking you guys this sort of pointed question. Um, feel free to answer it any way that you'd like, but what is your general opinion about life visiting, uh, extraterrestrial life visiting Earth? Is it, do you think, just purely works of fiction or do you hold out a little bit of X-Files, I believe, kind of, uh, you know, hope? I definitely you, believe. I definitely believe. I think yeah. it's naive to think that there isn't other life forms out there. Like there has to be. Like in all of the infinite universe, there has to be something other living than what is on our Earth. So a little bit of uh, contact philosophy contact the movie with Jodie Foster yeah. and where they find the alien signal and all of that. Yeah. That kind of, it would be a terrible waste of space if the universe was just for us. Yeah. It, it would be a terrible waste of space. I mean, no offense, but like, right. we're not doing anything in space right now. Like we're, we're kind of going to space, but we're not really doing much. Like NASA has been dismembered, you know, like, so, you know, I think that this, technology is there we have the engineers and the astrophysicists to do this stuff we just need the funding and that's where it goes all wrong because without the funding we can't become a power source in the universe you know okay i don't what know about we've, you, been, Betty? we've been do, we've been looking at space for a long time and not exploring the oceans but um I well how do we know okay wait a minute wait a minute stop for a second how do we know that the aliens, like in the abyss, which we brought up in under the sea in our one of our last podcasts, how do we know that those aliens aren't actually underneath the ocean? Exactly, because we're not looking. That's right. But I also am going along a similar idea to Tori. It's sort of arrogant to assume that mm. we're the only um, planet with living creatures on it. At the same time, you don't know if maybe maybe there's aliens on, like, the moon. It's not like we would necessarily know what we're looking for or if maybe they're on a different plane or whatever. So, right. And not to get too uh, esoteric or deeply philosophical here, but part of, I think, our issue and one of the reasons that fiction and stories become so incredibly near and dear to me along these same lines is because we don't really understand our own sentience. And so to assume that aliens or extraterrestrial life would have the same kind of sentience that we do is it's really difficult to unpack because there are so many elements that go along with this, but good science fiction in fact, I was just talking to my kid about this the other day. Good science fiction is meant to ask these incredibly difficult questions and make us think about whether 
there this stuff exists in fact uh there's a great meme out there that says um you know oh good old science fiction they you know would put something in a book and say in 2003 here we are visiting the stars and you know off doing all these things and i understand sort of like why that seems really funny but honestly the questions remain right if you read a good uh isaac asimov science fiction story if you take out any dates that are in there and you just think about the fundamental questions they're still the questions we're asking today um and there's a huge resurgence in these kinds of questions being asked i see it in arrival i see it in um interstellar i see there's all of these questions about sort of like the vastness of space and where is our place in the vastness of space now as it relates to aliens coming to earth i think sometimes we have a little bit of a of a problem because because we can only ask the questions from us we can't ask the questions that might be really important that we don't understand yet because we haven't had that kind of interaction Okay, so I promise that's about as philosophical as I'll get. Um, okay, so along those same lines, I'm going to ask you guys both another question. Uh, of the, what you think would be uh, the intent behind an extraterrestrial visit, would it be benevolent or would it be hostile? What do you think, Betty? I mean... I'm going to go with benevolent because it's a 50 50 chance either way. And <laughs> I mean, what do they care about us? It's, it, it's true. I, I oftentimes think about extraterrestrials as like, okay, these would be like the uh, national geographic and uh, kind of Disney esque cinematographers of their time in their native habitat here's the humans going about their daily bit like it uh, i can almost uh, hear uh, them I can almost like hear hitch hitchhikers whatever guys, yeah. they'll, yes, um, what, they'll get rid of us and they won't tell us they'll just put it on their bulletin board whatever <laughs> the equivalent to david attenborough is that exists on other planets that's the voice that i would probably hear narrating the all right what do you think tori i think it depends on what species the alien is like because, you know, in Star Trek, you got the Klingons and they're assholes. And then you got <laughs> you got their other alliances, you know. So, like, you know, I, I, it's it, like Ben said, it's a 50-50 shot. I would like to think they're all explorers and not conquistadors, not trying to take over the world, just trying to visit us and see about our culture like Stargate. But I mean, you never if, know. if they are coming to conquer us, we kind of had it coming at this point <laughs> yeah we did yeah we kind so, of did <laughs> okay so i i have two and i don't know if you've seen both of these movies but i have two ideas along the okay here's the sort of malevolent side instead of the benevolent side uh one is the thing right and the thing it, it, that actually is one of my all-time favorite movies it's on my top 10 list i could watch that movie every single day of the year and not be tired of it um, and, and it is terrifying because th many reasons, one is isolation. One is just the sheer ingenuity of the creature that crash landed on earth. Um, but I have to step back oftentimes and think, were they, was the thing actually mean and terrible or was it just trying to survive and of course trying to survive means that <laughs> we got the short end of the stick but that's one aspect and then there's the other aspect which i oftentimes think about too which is the alien versus predator aspect you have two alien species using our planet as their hunting grounds uh and so they you know hey this it looks like a great place to go and hang out and we are clueless and both of those ideas make me sort of sometimes think you know fictionally we really create worlds for aliens within our own world that are really very interesting like i like both of those ideas um 
but I'm, I want to ask you guys, what are your, what do you think, what kind of idea is your favorite sort of setting or backdrop for aliens to visit Earth? Is it, you know, like to be explorers or is it to uh, th- warn us about something like, uh, like the day the Earth stood still, warn us about impending doom or is it something else? What what would be yours, Tori? What do you think? <laughs> I th- I love the invasion, the mm. invasion aspect. Like, I like I like seeing like what kind of weapons these science fiction people have. You know what I mean? Like, what what are we pulling out for the big guns? You know, like if if aliens really attacked, what would what would Earth do? We probably wouldn't do anything because we have no protocols in place. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. We don't know that they have. If they have, that's protocols. true. CDC does have a protocol. If a zombie apocalypse actually happened, what what would happen? So maybe they have an alien. The CDC vision. has that. Yes, it's on their website. Yep. <laughs> it's it is on the website. Yeah. Uh yeah, and it's it, it's it's one of those things that makes you go. Um, Okay. I mean, normally I would never say this because I'm not one of those people that says, did my tax dollars pay for this? But <laughs> that's one of those times when I actually go, wait a second, who did I pay to do that? That's funny. Uh, uh, oh, okay. So, well, let me ask Betty first and then I have a follow-up question for you, Tori. So go ahead, Betty. Well, I'm hoping for benevolent and I don't really, do we really want to be in a situation where we're getting warned about something? Hmm. Or we're being attacked. Because if an alien comes with advanced weaponry like Tori is hoping for, <laughs> it's going to be like Fifth Element and we're all going to die. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I mean, look at us. We're a mess. <laughs> Uh, th- there is there is another scenario that kind of goes along with a lot of really good science fiction stories, and that is that aliens come to Earth to warn us about things that have happened to them. And they say things like, you know, hey, look, you guys are on the same trajectory. Uh, global warming is real. You know, you're going to fry yourselves or nuclear war is on the brink. Or, But, you know, what's funny to me is that we always seem to create stories where there is this... Uh, odd dichotomy between what they say that we already know and then what we do about it right because like uh in the super one of the superman movies um he takes all of the nuclear weapons and throws them at the sun and says no more you know we're not gonna have any more nuclear weapons and then what happens aliens come and it creates a a huge problem because then we don't have well, not then we don't have, but we end up not being able to protect ourselves against that very threat that perhaps that would have been one avenue for. It's just funny the way that we sort of set these scenarios up so that the aliens are both sort of like savior and at the same time, no, wait a minute, they're not really the savior because just because they solve our problems doesn't mean that that makes us any less who we are. We're still who we are. That to me, that is like the exact message oddly of uh, independence day, Mm -hmm. which I know was uh, Tori's movie for today. Um, Independence day. People don't, people save themselves from themselves. They don't save themselves from aliens. And at the root of independence day is this, this is our arrogance. Our arrogance leads us to be selfish and, uh, you know, ruthlessly undeserving of the knowledge that we could get. And instead, you know, we end up having to rely on gumption and uh, we end up having to figure out how to do things on our own. I, I, I feel the same way about signs. Did, have, did, have you guys seen M. Night Shyamalan signs? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's less of an alien movie than it is really a movie about somebody who loses their faith, right? I mean, it really is a character-centered drama. But the backdrop is, hey, there's these aliens here. And we end up having to be so resourceful that we can kick them off the planet. Um, that, and, and we do, and, and we do it with water. I mean, like, <laughs> it sounds absurd. It to- it does. It's, it totally sounds absurd. And yet at the same time, I got to say, 
that this is exactly the kind of story that I feel like is essential for us to keep exploring because it means it means that we can we really can figure these things out in simple form. We don't need giant weapons. We don't need massive technology. We just need human ingenuity. Human ingenuity always. I I actually do find that very uh, very interesting. And the reason that this podcast is aliens come to Earth and not aliens in general is because when we start talking about aliens in general, right? We set up world building. We set up uh, structures and technologies that don't always necessarily correlate with what we kind of have available to us here right now in the present. When we're stuck here on this earth, oftentimes our resourcefulness has to kind of take over. So, I, I, okay, I, I have a follow-up question for Tori, but before I get to that, I want to ask you guys if you've ever seen the movie um, District 9. Did you see the movie District 9, Betty? No, but I've heard okay. of it. So real brief, uh, an alien spacecraft comes to Earth and the aliens quite literally become refugees on the planet. They're in uh, a place in South Africa. Uh, they are, I mean, it's the greatest metaphor for apartheid that I think I have ever seen. It is absolutely breathtakingly awesome. I love it. Um, it, it, it really highlights in stark contrast how we treat each other because we are different we give each other all of these designations um they treat the aliens like you know they give them different classes they're you know, subclassed and they basically what they want to do in this movie is move an entire alien settlement from one place to another i have um, secrets i have i just forgot and and the most beautiful thing about this movie is that in the end the, our main character actually becomes one of the aliens and the, there is nothing to me there is nothing better in science fiction than exploring that kind of metamorphosis because it really kind of gets to the heart of why we love aliens so much which is hey we identify with all of these different traits all right so tori are you ready for your follow-up question yes i am go for okay. it my follow-up question to you specifically is if you think that not if you think if you love those stories uh about the insurgency of aliens and you know kind of like you know, the, the the big dramatic conquering of earth what is your favorite conquer earth movie and why no, that would be Independence Day. Is is that your favorite movie about conquering know, Earth? Because they didn't conquer Earth, or because you liked the way that they were that they set up the conquering of Earth? The the setup, okay, was you know they all beamed in on different big cities. Like that's how it probably would go. But I will say, War of the Worlds was also amazing, and I don't even know. I don't think was that a movie. I know it was, it was. A, okay yeah so there was a there was a tom cruise movie and there was one even before that too yeah and i knew it was a radio program before any of that but war of the worlds is like definitely one of those yeah look at that like that's so like if you saw that in the sky you would do what these guys are doing and freak freak out like i don't know what i would do i'd be like there's no i all right, they got me, you know? <laughs> I have no defenses against this. That's one of those things where I was like a kid watching that movie, like, how are they going to beat that? Mm. Just, you know, a UFO over the White House. Although, although, okay, so let's go, let's go back, though, to exactly what I was talking about before, which is how did they even figure out how to take those alien ships down? They figured it out by the simplest human technology, basically, which was a repeating signal that was hidden in the cable feeds, hidden in the satellite feeds. Uh, the, there is something uh, that happens in these movies, which I really love, that it always redefines human resourcefulness. When aliens come to Earth, it's always about the humans. It's never actually about the aliens. And I'm not saying that the aliens don't take up 
the role of being one or the other benevolent or malevolent, whatever you want, but it's always about the humans. Um, I was thinking yeah. the same thing. Go you ahead. Know what I think is really funny is even if it's an alien war movie, it's still a war movie. And then they defeat them by breaking a code. Right. Right. And, and, and oftentimes it's like, it is something that only humans could possibly know, right? The aliens are so high tech or so, uh, their, their technology is so far superior that only we would know these really super basic, simple things like some kind of repeating feed in a satellite signal, uh, there, or in signs with the water. I mean, like there is something so simplistic about human ingenuity. The speech in Independence Day is one of the, I mean, that speech gets replayed a lot. And that is, if not a Churchill kind of a moment, I don't know what is. It brings back these kind of, I, I, I gotta say, I, 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 you know, again, not to get too far into politics or anything, but hearing President Zelensky speak is a lot like listening to President Whitmore in the fiction speak. They both have those oh, like yeah. larger than life kind of, this is our Independence Day feeling. And there's a good reason for that. You know, that actually, I think, really speaks to who we are as people. Maybe he had a um, um, writer writing the speech for him. Yeah, right. Well, He's like, you know, what, Independence Day. <laughs> yeah, make me look like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. So I, I, I was going to talk a little bit about how aliens have kind of changed in our fiction, especially in our movies. You know, since the early, early days of movie making, um, and how CGI and practical effects have really altered our ability to reimagine what aliens are and then i want to circle back to something else but i want you guys to tell me what you think was like the first alien that you ever saw in a movie that had a huge impact on you either scared you or made you go oh i gotta learn more about this what was yours tori fire in the sky oh that, movie, that was that was actually a scary yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah, it was. Who and I was like eight when it came out. I was like, oh my god! And so I got so spooked by that movie. My okay, tell them the story real quick. <laughs> I did in ground pool right, and the in ground pool had lights in it, so whenever it was dark, you could see in the pool, right? Oh right. And, and my parents would keep the lights on overnight. And I was swore that it was a beacon for aliens and they were <laughs> in our pool. So like I, had, I made my mom turn it off every night. Like, no, don't turn the lights on. Uh, but that that movie really made me start really thinking about aliens. And also that show sightings. That was a really good show too. Hmm. That yeah, that was a good show. You're right. The the a fire in the sky also reminds me of um uh oh gosh okay what was the name of the movie where it is it's supposed to be based off of a true story similar to this one uh yeah. but they're in Nome Alaska um uh oh gosh that's gonna really bug me I'll remember but in the meantime Betty you tell me what was your what alien did you see first that had a huge impact on you well, I'm gonna go with E.T. Mm, because, oh, good one um I can't say I knew anything about aliens when I saw E.T. And I didn't really understand the concept of aliens. No, me either. Yeah, I was like, what? He's kind of weird looking. <laughs> I was like, what, what is that thing? And But it's also one of those movies that everyone loves and everyone can talk about. But I did not like it. I thought it was boring. Oh, wow. And so <laughs> for years, I well, grew up going, I hate E.T. And everyone loves it. <laughs> As an 80s kid, I absolutely loved E.T. Uh, I also grew up watching Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So I was of the mindset that, you know, any kind of alien uh, interaction was going to be positive. Like it was going to be, you know, interesting, not scary. Um, and the movie that I was thinking of is called The Fourth Kind. Um, um. 
and that the, the it that movie is um <laughs> which actually dovetails into close encounters of the third kind uh the fourth kind was supposed to be it they did such a brilliant job of marketing that movie um but there are aliens that come to the planet and really psychologically mess with this particular town in Nome, Alaska. Um, it's, it's an interesting, it, it, it's an interesting movie. Uh, it's not the best of the best of the best, but it was an interesting movie. Um, why Alaska? Why Nome, Alaska? Because in Alaska and especially in Nome, it's, it is, it's a, it's a fairly well-developed place and similar to 30 days of night they also go through uh periods in the winter where there is practically no sun and so the conditions are really right for what we consider to be because this is another thing that of course i mean i'm going to go off on a tangent here but this is another thing that i think that we oftentimes really don't understand as humans because we fear the night and we should because we are not hunters of the night right we are not wild cats we're not prey that way or i'm sorry we're not predators that way um we assume that aliens almost by and large only come at night we have very few even fictional stories where daytime aliens are a thing that's true well, and it, it it's it's kind it really it kind of goes back to the idea that well if aliens come from the stars and we can only see the stars at night then aliens can only come at night because that's the only time the stars are visible which is ridiculous of course because the stars are always there i mean you know come on i don't need to actually give anybody a science lesson but it's just to me this is one of those like acutely psychological uh pieces of storytelling that always kind of make me laugh like there's no reason that we shouldn't have ufos in the middle of the day they probably would be harder for us to see because th the sun definitely glares things but i sit up here at 3,000 feet on my mountain and i watch the planes come into the airport in the valley below and i see every single plane so uh, it, it's not I don't feel like it's totally out of the realm of possibility. Um, okay, uh, Betty, I'm going to ask you uh, a, a a very personal question. That uh, feel free to elaborate as much or as little as you'd like. <laughs> Fictionally, one of the things that I see a lot, a, a lot of tropes of, is aliens that come to Earth and either have like direct connections with a human or a group of humans, right? Would you want to be one of those humans that had direct connections to whatever the alien life was that came to Earth? And tell us why. Yes. First of all, because I'm nosy. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I know more than somebody else. I mean, who wouldn't want that? And then, um, yeah, why not? How interesting would that be? Like, Scientists have in, have been studying space for how long? And then I would have I would have somebody right here telling me more than they they know. So mm. I think it would be fascinating. Okay. What about <laughs> you, Tori? It would be best friends, just like ET. Yes. I would make the alien my bestie. We would go out to lunch. I would teach it the ways of the humans. And then we would do some sort of baptism, you know? Like, <laughs> some pieces. I so, can't know, but for real, like it would be, it would be really awesome to like sit down and actually talk to an alien, you know, like what world have you been to? Like what kind of stuff is out there? I would have so many questions. I mean, who do you think God is? yeah did you see him out there <laughs> do you are you a christian yeah <laughs> so in to... in 2011 there was a movie that came out and it, the name of it was <laughs> paul p-a-u-l mm -hmm. and it oh my god wow there that is so cool thanks josh <laughs> uh and so 
this particular alien is exactly what you were talking about. They set off in that, for those of you that can't see it, there's an RV in the background. They set off in this RV with this alien and they have this amazing adventure. And it is one of the, I think, most hilariously on point movies that feature exactly everything that we think about aliens and offers the alien the ability to have sarcasm that is so razor biting that it almost hurts. It's really, really good. Um, and this is exactly the kind of thing that I think we oftentimes miss. Now, not to go too far out of the realm of movies here because this is the movie Potluck, but I will say that on Paramount, I have been watching uh, Star Trek. Um, mm -hmm. And... Yeah, we have too. We just got done doing all the all of them: Discovery, Voyager, Enterprise, not Deep Space uh, Nine though. No. So the new one um, is called. It's not Brave New World. What is it called? Strange New Worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Strange New Worlds. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm so sorry. I am That's always it? thinking of Brave. It, there's a new Star Trek series. Uh, we had just finished watching Picard, and Picard is actually really good too. Um, this, that's another sort of interesting interface where they definitely get put back on Earth and have to experience things all over again from Earth's perspective. Um, Strange New Worlds is not that. Uh, it has Anson Mount in it. He's really good as Captain Pike. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the sort of like the prequel to Star Trek, right? Before the five-year mission of... Uh, explore strange new worlds. You have Captain Pike learning about the Prime Directive, understand really using some of the same Star Trek formulaic uh, pieces, but doing it a bit more updated, more modern. Um, and one of the things that I find interesting is the it, th that particular piece with Star Trek has the same feel to it, I guess that that what we're talking about right now, which is it's the human interface that matters, right? But in Star Trek, they definitely explore different ideas of what specifically we call life is. So a colony of amoeba really might be extraterrestrial life. And we might never discover that because we don't, we're not going to be out there looking for amoebas. Mm -hmm. But, but honestly, it, it, can you imagine what would happen if, right, if tomorrow one of the Mars probes found amoebas on Mars? Technically, I mean, and we, obviously, I guess we wouldn't be able to call them amoebas because they would be formed yeah. from something else. But, if we found even single celled life forms on another planet, that technically would be extraterrestrial life. Now, the reason that I bring this up at all is because sometimes we explore these ideas of what extraterrestrial life is. And then the, in fictional stories, we bring it back to earth and then it creates all of these like really terrible that we have big cataclysmic events because of it. Um, and that's another, I think, uh, interesting idea behind not, not necessarily sentient life. Like the thing, I never felt like in the thing that, that that life form was actually sentient. It felt to me like it was opportunistic and it was, it, it was looking for a way to continue to survive at any cost. But I never got the idea like that there was, you know, some kind of malevolence behind it. What it was, what created that was when it uh, was able to turn into Doc. And then it used Doc's ability to be able to think. But it was humanness, humanness, I can't think of a better word, that really caused all of the big problems, right? Because that's where things really went off the rails. Anyway, I digress. Um, okay, I, I'm going to tell you uh, uh, just a really quick, uh, my first alien story. So we have this place uh, up on Lake George in upstate New York. It's a cabin. Um, it's in this small little town called Ticonderoga. It's a no nothing. I mean, it's very small. The town is so tiny. 
it's amazing. I grew up every single summer there and we would be outside, I would say more hours of the day and the night than, than we were ever inside. It was just an incredible experience. And at night we always would look up to the sky and we always were looking for something. Did you see that? Was it a shooting star? Did I mean, we had fantastical stories to tell each other about all these different ideas of, you know, space, whatever, just many different ideas. Okay. So when I was, when I was old enough to really kind of watch uh, shows that were alien-ish, right? I started to realize that not everybody thought about aliens the way that I did. Because again, I always thought of aliens as being, they're going to come and they're going to make us our friend, or they're going to be friends with us. They're going to give us some kind of technology that we don't have. We're going to be so much better off. And I had also really been reading a ton of science fiction that sort of backed that up, right? Okay. Then I started seeing movies like uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still and War of the Worlds. And clearly that's not what happens. <laughs> um, and it and it's really terrifying. It's really, it's very terrifying to think about those things, especially when you're a kid, because you literally have like, you, there's a sense of existential dread that you can't even identify. You're a little kid and you're already thinking about like human extinction. It's just, it's huge. Okay. When I was, when I was in the third grade, my, um, Science teacher told me the moon was dying. I haven't been. Oh my god! I was like, "Oh wow!" When the moon dies, and she couldn't tell me. (laughs) That's terrible. (laughs) If I had been your science teacher, I would have told you straight up: the moon's already dead, and we could have just gone on from there. Oh, because I—I mean, really, the moon. Actually, I'm sorry, but actually, the moon is dead. There really isn't anything there. Yeah, (laughs) but it's a—but it's a beautiful rock. I mean, it's gorgeous. Okay. All right. So fast forward to my uh, my real sort of like uh, I'm into every single movie that there possibly is. And I have realized that the trend that we have created now is to, like I said in my intro, create a, a really weird kind of feeling where we have half of our mix is aliens are going to come and try to take over the world and we're going to be able to kill them by simple technology like cell phones or i don't know handguns whatever and then there are the other movies that create aliens as saviors of the planet like superman and um i i feel like even sometimes predator oddly is like yeah, see, this is a cautionary tale. All humans can learn from this kind of cautionary tale. Um, or, uh, you know, one of the one of my earliest memories, I was going to, I'm sorry, I should tell you this first. The earliest memory that I have of, of an alien movie was Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, yeah, that's a scary one, too. And it, it for as simple as that movie is, with really, like, zero special effects, it is absolutely terrifying. Um, I feel like, oh, I feel like I the terrified. more simple the movie the more realistic it seems, so the scarier it seems. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely true. If it could happen, then I'm scared. Although, although, and this is what I alluded to before, uh, our, uh, the interesting trend now in moving our CGI into uh, areas of hyper-realism, like to make things that already are real, hyper real is also an interesting it it, sometimes i think it actually divorces us from the realism of the situation so when you try to take something that could exist and then really splash it with cgi then it starts to feel like well maybe this is fake again which is also another weird kind of thing it like it like it takes you out of time and place so instead of feeling like i'll give you an example there was this movie called Attack the Block. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but it is, it's a movie about this group of uh, people that are in this neighborhood. And I'm going to preface this by saying that Attack the Block is, it, it's a, it's a, it's a story of its culture, of our culture. 
Um, it is definitely a, uh, like, there's a lot of cultural references in it that are a little bit, uh, we all would get them, but they, uh, they're going to date the movie in 10 years. Um, and these people that are in this group, it's a city, right? Um, and the, these aliens come and basically they're just trying to protect their block. Uh, it, it It's reminiscent of uh, Precinct 13. Did you guys ever see Precinct 13? Uh, or the 13th Precinct, whatever. I can't remember what it was called. But basically, like, they're, they're just trying to defend this one area, which is just their street block from the aliens. And it, it the, the organic feeling of being chased through your own neighborhood by things that are out of your control is both awesome and also, I think, very terrifying. Like, the place that you consider to be safe, all the safe havens that you know in your own little area are suddenly totally off limits and everything is a trap. That's the kind of... So it's like the monster in the house genre, except for a little except bit Except for like... it's on... Right, it's on the street and it's aliens. But exactly the same thing. Yep, exactly the same thing. It's, it's actually, it's really well done. I mean, it's not the best movie ever, but it's really well done done i really liked the idea and the concept a lot um, well, um i would say look at a quiet place that movie is yes. terrifying and yes a, a, even a quiet place is too yep goodness I, 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 th that was really scary I, you know you know what makes a quiet place scary what makes a, pl a quiet place scary is the, the inevitability well yes the silence there <laughs> there is an inescapable inevitability that we know that we as humans have to make noise there and there's very little way to escape it like we think of noise as actually a good thing because it's what creates sound i mean it's what creates our, uh, our we speech well we wouldn't have we wouldn't have language if we didn't have speech there just as long as it's not too loud just as long as it's not too loud <laughs> um i i I, I, you know, that actually might make a good movie. We should definitely think about that kind of movie. That'd be good. Um, okay, I'm going to switch tracks just slightly. Um, of all of the alien tech that you guys have ever seen, what movie do you think shows the best alien tech ever? Like the coolest idea for alien tech? What about you, Tori? Oh, that's a hard one. Um... Really? Ooh. Yeah, I mean, I need the options. Star Trek movies, their technology, their Star Wars, their technology, uh, different planets are different uh, stages of their technology, you know, so I think that's those, those two, because it's the, it, they kind of make it the most realistic technology, you know, like it could really be, it could really be happening. What about you, Betty? Can I say, um, Marvel, because they go into space, they have aliens, but mm -hmm. Wakanda has the coolest tech ever. Uh, that this is very true. This is very true. So, I would go with, <clears throat> just because I love you so much, Stephen, tonight, I would go with Pacific Rim. And Pacific Rim was the movie with the kaiju and the Jaegers. They have these big giant mecha suits that they have created, and they are used to battle these larger-than-Godzilla monsters, right? But the only way that they can make them work is with two partners inside of these Jaegers and they have to do something called go into the drift. Uh, and it, it is, it, it's a fantastic idea. It's unbelievably open-ended and just has so many different, it, there's just so many different pieces to it. But ultimately the technology of the Jaeger to me is one of those things that's like, we have become the Autobots. Uh, we have become the, 
the battling of an alien species by becoming an alien species is, I think, the pinnacle of human science fiction evolution. We absolutely but who, but make this better? so awesome. What's that? But who wore it better, them or the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? Um, <laughs> you know, in in the, uh, okay, I'm gonna unless we're talking about Tommy the Green Ranger, I'm gonna go with Pacific. And he I'll, turned into the I'll White concede, Ranger. Yes, I'll concede that the Dragon Sword was pretty amazing. The Red Ranger was the best Ranger, but the Pink Ranger was the hottest Ranger. <laughs> it's true, and uh, we have uh, we we definitely have a lot of uh, Kimberly uh, pictures in my family with uh, kids dressing up as Kimberly, but we have just as many pictures of uh, all my kids dressing up as Jason, boys and girls, because everybody wanted to be Jason. So I had the I, red. I, can, I had the Red Power Ranger costume. I, I can I completely believe it. I can completely believe it. Okay, uh, so I know we're running a little bit short on time, but I want to get to one more movie, which I don't know if either of you guys have seen, but I really want to talk about it because this is the next genre of science fiction that I absolutely adore. And that is uh, the, the, the realm of the alien is somebody who says that they are an alien and then we have to discern whether that's true or not because we don't believe it you're an alien what really no you're not an alien that's ridiculous um k-pax was I knew you were gonna say that yep I knew you were gonna the, say the, that. that movie that movie made me it, it changed my mind about so many things it not only is it like the best metaphor for uh, experiencing and living through trauma, which I feel like is just so underexplored, but it also leaves you with the open question at the end of, was he an alien or was he not an alien? What really happened here? And I loved that. I just loved it. But and if you're looking for something a little bit more lighthearted, K-Pax is very, very, it's a big movie and it's very heavy. Um, if you're looking for something more lighthearted, um, the movie that was um, Martian Child was also in a similar scope, but a lot more lighthearted. Um, the little boy believes that he is a Martian, and he's got a lot of interesting things in his past, not good things. Um, and it, it's about the adults in his life trying to understand why does this kid think that he's an alien? It's that one's actually really good too. I, I liked it a lot. Um, but it's a lot more, it's a lot more, uh, it, it's kind of like K-Pax, but a little bit less. So easier to digest, but also very good. Um, and also- So what's he an alien? I, again, I'm going to leave these all open sort of as I don't feel like the movie ever actually says, okay, no, this person was not an alien or yes, they were. They all come to their own either acceptance or they disappear, leaving us as the audience to kind of guess what is really happening. Um, the other one in the same genre, although definitely he was an alien because we know that, that this is what happened, is Starman, where he comes back to earth basically in the form uh, in the body of um uh and i forgot her name but her husband who died and she's already grieving and going through absolute misery because her husband died and star the the person who is starman um reanimates the body and and using dna basically i mean like it's there's a whole science thing behind it um, but she has to experience life now with this alien in the in basically the form of her dead husband. Um, and again, it's these things are all they're so personal. They're so up close and um, make, I think, the this particular uh, part of the science fiction genre with aliens very interesting in a way that is not lasers and guns or mars attacks crazy um aliens you know that are going to take over the world or or even sort of the saviors of anything they're just human 
conditions human behaviors, human emotions, that uh, I think sometimes we're trying to find an outlet for, like they're alien outlets. So, okay, so I can't, I can't end the show. First of all, we have to talk about food, but I can't end the show without asking you guys, um, do you guys love Lilo and Stitch and why? Absolutely. Yeah, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't it was really. So, a, it was everybody so, has to love Lilo and Stitch. It was so cute. I love Stitch so much. I, I had a stuffed Stitch. I, yeah, that was a great movie. Um, I, as Disney movies go, first of all, as, uh, as the, representative of hawaii here uh i have to say that lilo and stitch is one of the few movies that i have ever seen that actually does hawaii right like this is that's actually what it feels like to live here it's i mean minus the aliens but yeah, it's yeah, yeah. absolutely astounding it just got everything not, perfect am i the only one you didn't really like lilo and stitch uh you didn't like you okay maybe do you didn't like the movie lilo and stitch but tell me you didn't love stitch you didn't love stitch Really? I mean, I get really stressed out watching that movie for that poor little girl at first. Like, oh yes, Le Lilo and Nani are definitely uh, an interesting dynamic. That is for sure. And uh, and also, I, I like think music. Also, one of the most real uh, sort of Disney plights that um, that that I two people both against each other and for each other um and yes i can see why it's stressful and yes. he's cute also, and he is cute but yeah it's so stressful i the, the reason that i also love lilo and stitch is because stitch to me is the perfect representative of what i think we sort of sometimes try to get to in tropes and can't really get there um and that is an alien that comes to earth and realizes that the power of human love is actually everything that they've been missing. And I love that because that is truly what makes us, I think, unique in, and I'm not saying like, I, I can't arrogantly say that other, you know, extraterrestrial yeah, life forms don't feel love, but it's one of the things that I feel like we as humans, this is, this is what we think our best attributes are our best attributes are our power of togetherness, love, care, you know, the, the stuff that's good about being human is all sort of wrapped up into that. And I, I did really, I love that. I thought that was a great, uh, that was a great uh, sort of put forth this idea piece. Um, okay. So um, uh, now I got to ask Betty, Betty, what was the movie that you chose for tonight? Uh, if you did choose a movie and, or did you, want to pick one of the movies that we talked about and tell us what you think about it and what food would you bring for this movie? Well, I'm choosing a quiet place. Um, mm. I thought it was brilliant. I mean, the silence and then the sign language that was used, like it was terrifying. Like what you can't see is terrifying. And then somehow they made it more suspenseful because usually it's the music that makes a movie suspenseful. Hmm. That's a good point. Opposite. Yeah. So I thought it was like really well done. And I think we're, since we're going with a quiet place, we should go with soft foods like mm. mashed potatoes and peas <laughs> and that can be found at, um, on a blue, blue paper, uh, Blue plate special at 3 a.m. at Piccadilly <laughs> or 3 p.m. at Piccadilly. So no popcorn. No popcorn. No chips. No chips. <laughs> they're called the, the the creatures in a quiet place are called death angels. Um, which I also found super fascinating. The 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 creatures are called death angels. I love that. So um, soft cakes because... in the shapes of angels would be good. You can make that. I was I was just going to suggest that. I was just going to suggest that. Um, I, I could also just fashion mashed potatoes in the shape of angels. And that would be great too. We can, we can, instead of making, <coughs> excuse me. See, I started to laugh. Instead of making snow angels, we could make mashed potato angels. <laughs> yes. Yum. Okay, Tori, what was your movie and what food are you bringing to our awesome potluck tonight? Okay. So Independence Day. 
and I'm going to pick Americanized food, like hot dogs and hamburgers, because it was the 4th of July, and that's what you eat on the 4th of July is hot dogs Freedom and hamburgers. Fries. Freedom, Freedom fries. Freedom fries. <laughs> in here. <laughs> Well, I, I got to say, my favorite line in Independence Day is just Will Smith's one-liner, welcome to Earth. Just, yeah, I love no matter, That's I great. Had, I had the biggest, I still have a big crush on Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> <laughs> no one else in the world does. What is, with, what is with everyone being in love with that guy recently? Really? I've always, been, like, since Jurassic Park have been in love with this guy. But, like, recently, oh, I don't I've just seen like a major resurgence of him. Like everyone's like Jeff Goldblum. And I mean, I don't get it because I'm a lesbian, but <laughs> like in general, where did he come back from? N nerd culture. Yeah. Just Fair. nerd culture. Yeah. He was a fly. Um, I mean, we, run the, we, we do run the earth now. It's <laughs> true. It's true. I mean, our time has come. So finally. <laughs> I mean, look yes, at Marvel. Should... It's all just a bunch of nerd stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no kidding. And without being hipster about anything, you know, to all of us who grew up reading comics before they were ever even made into movies, like this is the time you just feel like, oh, finally, <gasps> validation. <laughs> yeah, we it was the Spider-Man era, but now look at us at a new Spider-Man era. Y yeah, so you know, I... At some point, we'll have to do this in a podcast, but at some point, uh, I feel a little bit nervous that we are going to burn out on the superhero genre. And it's similar to the way that we did with vampires, similar to the way that we did with zombies, like we we do something to death. And then, you know, 10 years later, we pick it back up again and go, oh, hey, remember this, everybody? Nostalgia. We'll see. Um Okay, we're so, excited to see what happens next, too. Yes, and I, I think we've got there's still a bit of a run left in uh, superheroes. I do not feel I just watched Moon Knight or finished watching Moon Knight, and there's still a, so much left in superhero exploration. But the, I mean, there are so many comics to explore; they will never run out of original material. It's just not possible. Who's going um, to be next? Yeah, right. So I, I, I was really uh, baffled by what movie to actually choose for tonight, and what to kind of do as a, a food choice. <clears throat> and so I settled instead on uh, because I love all of these movies. I, I have to admit, I do have a soft spot for K-Pax, but I also have a huge soft spot for Pacific Rim. It's again, it's one of those movies that I could watch a lot. I just really love it. And I also, like I said, can the thing is in my top 10 movie list. So I think I'd probably go with the thing. Um, but I am absolutely positively not going to bring any food inspired by the thing because my guess is I would get kicked out of the potluck. Mm -hmm. So uh, I won't do that. Uh, I might actually bring some whiskey because I feel like that is never a bad choice. And that's <laughs> my basically, that's basically all he drank, right? Is he just drank whiskey. Um, uh, but... I also, <clears throat> just recently, we decided to make uh, this, this. I don't want to call it a dish. It was kind of more of a dessert. But we made this like constellation dessert where we had chocolate pudding. And our chocolate pudding was inset with our little star-shaped sugar cookies. And we tried to recreate. We recreated a couple of different. We did Orion's Belt, but we also did... Um, uh, the constellation of Taurus, which I don't know if you ever really look at the constellations, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly where the pictures are. Um, so it really just sort of felt like a free for all with cookies and chocolate pudding, but it was really fun. It was definitely a very night sky uh, dessert that I think would fit in good with our aliens from outer space, since obviously they had to come from the stars. Um, my closing question to you guys tonight. If tomorrow we learned from some leaked Pentagon paper that aliens have actually been here all this time, what movie do you think would 
best describe our reaction to that news? Any ideas? The way they acted in ET, everyone freaking out and like, mm. like everyone went mental and this, it was just this little guy. Plus, it's like, <laughs> right. and the plus was trying to agree <laughs> that they're going to want to um, experiment on him. Whatever comes, oh for sure. If they yeah, haven't our, already been experimenting for however long. I absolutely believe that that is true, one hundred percent. What about you, Tori? What I movie don't... do you think? Any movie describe what you think is like the quintessential human response? I would go again with Independence Day. Like everybody was like, "Oh my God, what do we do?" Like it was in 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 all invasion movies. It's like everybody freaks out too. But like, what else are you gonna do? Like. Do you think? I mean, do you really think our world um, leaders would come together that well, though? And no, absolutely not. We would be vaporized. No. Yes, we would all be atomic bomb. It, it would just be a. We would be a nuclear wasteland. Whatever their version <laughs> of nuclear nuclear bombs are, <laughs> we're gone. So I, I, I'm actually going to go with the response that uh, I, that I saw in They Live. Right, They Live was the movie about the aliens that basically subtly take over all of human civilization for their own nefarious purposes and keep people quote unquote asleep right and only the special sunglasses reveal everything that's underneath it um i feel like humans would probably be in that vein if the aliens came here and just kind of quietly took over but i also believe a hundred an 85 million percent Impossible. that if the aliens came, I know, but sorry, you know, <laughs> we're talking science fiction, not science, so we're good. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> that's not real either. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if they were able to be contained, <clears throat> and if we thought that they were, uh, if we thought that they were, uh, conquerable, I totally believe that we would do exactly what they did in District 9. And we would herd everybody together as much as possible and try to keep them all contained in one space and probably in some way subjugate them so that they could benefit us instead of the other way around. Like, would we actually be looking for alien tech that could help us? No, we would be looking for alien tech that could create weapons. Would we be looking for a way to help the aliens? No, we would be looking for a way for us to be able to benefit from whatever their existence was. And I hate that because I feel like that's so dark and so um, unoptimistic, but it's that's true, though. kind of what I think. Yeah. We always exploit exactly. everywhere, everywhere we go, we exploit everything. Yep. And, and yep. We're afraid of what we do not know. We're it's afraid of what we do not know. Yes. And and that ultimately is what I think the fictive aliens come to earth genre is all about. What we do not know is scary. And that's why we keep telling stories about it over and over and over again. So uh I have had a really awesome time on this podcast. Thank you guys so much. Um Betty, how can we find you on social media? Tell us all about it. I am on TikTok and Instagram at um, Betty Chitty Bang Bang. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Very awesome. And Tori, how can we find you on social media? Well, uh, okay. So I have my own show called The Infectious Geek. You can find it on my Facebook Live, uh, my Facebook Live or my YouTube channel, The Infectious Geek geek official um and then you can also get me every tuesday night when we do uh another show called the pilot season while we take pilots of different tv shows and we review them and that's really cool the next show that we're doing is the sopranos so that should be fun and of course you can get me every week here on the movie potluck awesome and you can find me at moviesandmeals.com. Um, I am going to look real briefly at my cheat sheet for next week because I completely forgot what our podcast is about next week. Uh, I want to say that it's not the myth one, right? I, now I'm completely confused. I can't remember what we put together for next week. 
I know it was I never something. remember. Uh, I know it, it, it was, and now I can't even find my cheat sheet. Oh, no, this is not good. Uh, let's see. Where is my cheat sheet? It is not available to me right now. Okay, well, uh, next week we are definitely going to have some podcast. I, I, <laughs> I seriously can't remember what we put together for next week. What did we put together? Um, we did... Was it myth? No, it wasn't myth. It was... Ah, I know what it was. It. Um, we put together... Uh, let's see. Hold on a second. I just found it. Not so that I don't say the wrong one. It is... Oh, that's right. Okay. This classic... It's classic literature adaptations. Ooh. Classic literature adaptations. So bring with uh, you to our next potluck um, any movie that has been adapted uh, from a piece of classic literature. So by classic literature, I'm sure you know what I mean. Um, the Count of Monte Cristo, uh, Les Miserables. Um, lots of, in fact, I mean, in I the cupboard. Indian in the cupboard. Any movie that you can think of that you love that was adapted by uh, the great anybody Gatsby. in Hollywood. Oh God, yes, The Great Gatsby. Please, somebody pick The Great Gatsby. I'm definitely gonna pick that. <laughs> uh, it's and, so small. And hopefully, we will see everybody back here then. Thank you, everyone, for coming to our podcast. We'll see you next week. <laughs>